Uh, good morning. Our scripture reading is actually from 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. The word of the Lord. That in mind, now please open our, our hearts and our minds to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, do you ever notice in this, in this era where lawsuits are everywhere, the more, the more we have lawsuits everywhere, the more there has to be warning signs or labels everywhere? And some of them make a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, the, there's some things that are dangerous and they're confusing, and, and, you know, like street signs, when you go into a new town, it's really nice when they mark the one way appropriately so you don't turn against the flow of traffic on accident. Uh, so some, some warning signs or, or directional signs, they're, they're very necessary. And then there's some others that you look at and you go, are, are people really this dumb? Like, you know, when you open up every single container of... Uh, whatever, medicine or vitamins, and have that little packet, and it says, silica, do not eat. You have, to, you have to be told this. You have to be told this, because apparently um, we would just eat it without warnings. Uh, and there's some, there's some crazy ones. Like, there's on a baby stroller. I was looking these up just in preparation for the sermon. You know, I, when it's like, my mind, my mind is full of the biblical truth. Let's look at something fun. Let's look at silly warning signs. And one of them was on a baby stroller. And get, make sure to give the warning, remove baby before folding. You're just like, kind of hoped, kind of hoped you figured this out. Where's the kid? <laughs> I don't know. Um, or, you know, this, this isn't so much a warning, but I was just like, okay. A warning label was on a box of rat poison. And it said, warning. Uh, this has been found to cause cancer in laboratory mice. I'm like, I th I'm thinking that's the least of their worries. I know it's actually like you shouldn't carry it around in your pocket because, you know, you, and, and if you want to carry around rat poison, I think that's a, like, play at your own risk type adventure. But uh, the other one I, I love with an iron um, on the box, it said, do not iron while wearing this shirt. Or it was actually for an iron-on label. You're like, please take off the shirt before ironing. Uh, yeah, and, uh, or, or my favorite, um, on a washing machine. It's on the inside there, and it says, it's a, a very firm reminder, please do not put people inside of the washing machine. Now, parents, y you know that one's probably valid, but the only people they're really concerned about are your kids playing hide-and-go-seek who aren't going to read the warning label anyway. So... Um, We've seen lots, you know, and so you see these, you see these warning signs and you think, come on, no, nobody should really need these warnings, should they? And yet then, if you're ever on social media, you'll see all of the reasons why people need these warnings. It's, it's really crazy. I feel like there's two groups of people in life. There are those of you who are inherently safe. You're like, you know, I, I, okay, I'm going to go out on, on, on my bicycle. I need my helmet. I need my elbow pads. I need my knee pads. I need, like five feet of bubble wrap to wrap around my body. And then there's the other people who, when they see a sign, danger, do not go on beyond this point, look at the sign and go, oh, that must be where the really cool stuff is. Grab your cameras, right? So, and I, I hope you live somewhere in between those two extremes. But we understand. Um, while we shouldn't put people in washing machines, I feel like we should just know that. Um, some of the warnings from Jesus today we definitely need to know, and they definitely should be heeded. And if we don't already know, we need, we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. So let's continue where we were last week. We just addressed 
uh, Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. He'd been talking about his coming death, which they didn't understand. And then they, they in response, had been talking about who's the greatest. So when you say, like, how, how foolish can people be? Jesus is saying, hey, I'm about to die. And they're like, we don't get that. So which one of us is the best? You know, sometimes you're like, you, you understand why Jesus would get frustrated with the disciples. Why he gets frustrated with us. And, and just the grace and the patience of God towards us is, is astounding. But they needed some, stru- some instruction. They needed some correction. And he begins to teach them that they need to view Christ's kingdom differently. Not like the earthly kingdom with earthly rulers. But differently. Because he's a different king. And they, as his subjects, need to be different, too. And that's, and that's where we were leaving off, where the Apostle John had a question. There was a person trying to cast out a demon in the name of Jesus. And John's like, what should we do about him? He's not one of us. And Jesus basically says, let him be. And, and he said, we, we talked about last week, rather, it's not the credentials that makes a person qualified for service. It's God who qualifies the person, and we talked about that. And we're not going to spend too much time circling back. And so while we're on the one hand saying, look, we're not trying to go for status. We're not trying to go for position. We're not trying to go to impress other people. We're not trying to look to have this list of approved credentials or candidates to a certain degree. Obviously, when we send out missionaries, we, we check who we're supporting and sending out. And testing of the spirits is important. But he says, you know, time is going to tell if they went out of my name. But then he also gives the other side of this warning. The first of which is here in verse 42. But for those who are deliberately leading people astray, God will deal with them. And we, and we read this here, verse 42. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble... It would be better for him if a heavy millstone was hung around his neck and he had been cast into the sea. We have have a very strong warning of those who lead others astray. There's there's both sides of the argument. We're people who like to go like a pendulum from one extreme to the other, and you need to be able to hold both these truths together and say... Yes, it's appropriate to test the spirits. Be careful of who you're listening to. Make sure it matches Scripture. That's what that's saying. Not everyone who says, I have received, you know, knowledge from the Lord. I'm giving you a teaching from the Lord. You don't just accept that blindly. You don't accept what I'm teaching you as your pastor blindly. I hope you bring your Bibles. I hope you check it. I hope you read it. Sometimes I misspeak and say some really goofy things. Like, you know, when Moses took the animals on the ark, and you're like, oh, I know. You can, you can say, I know he meant Noah. But occasionally you can say something like really wrong accidentally. You say the exact opposite because your mind goes faster than your mouth. I'm, I'm sure that's not just me who does that. I'm, most of you parents have call, called your children by the wrong name occasionally. But when you're in front of people, but when you're in front of people speaking all the time, you have a lot more opportunity to actually accidentally misspeak. So yeah, bring your Bibles, check them, be vigilant. But there's a warning for those who are leading people astray. Jesus told his disciples not to oppose those that they don't know, but he's not soft on false teachers, those who would mislead the people he cares about. And he talks about the judgment of those who are leading the others astray, and the language is quite telling. These are powerful descriptions. Now, they're not really talking about it. He says, it would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the ocean. He's not referring to the literal ocean, but really drawing their their attention to the eternal judgment. He says, it would be better than for you to be drowned in an ocean than to face God for that kind of offense. So he's correcting the disciples about seeking their own validation and their own position. And says, you know, be careful here. If 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 you're seeking to be on Team Jesus for your own acclaim, chances are you might be ignoring the people that God sent you to minister to. And even worse, what about those who peddle religion for falsehoods, deliberate falsehoods, with those who exploit others to feed their own ambitions or lusts in the name of Jesus? And we know that they're there. 
We know we've seen them. And Scripture is quite consistent in its condemnation of such false teachers. I, I know there's a spirit of the day, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe. But that, that's not true. There's life and there's death. There's eternal salvation. And it's in the name of Jesus. And there are people who would create all sorts of different fictions for themselves, for their own ego, for their own pocketbook, for their own sensuality, for a number of things. And we are warned. This isn't a new thing. This has been happening since the beginning. The early writers, the people who walked with Christ, gave these warnings that this was already the case. In the book of Jude, we read, These men blaspheme the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, and when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water, carried by day winds. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild, wind, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Second Peter says it uh, pretty straightforward. He says, but false teachers also arose among the people, and there will be false teachers among you who secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and then the end, their destruction is not asleep. In Jeremiah verse 14, this, this goes on. It's Old Testament, it's New Testament. People are the same. Our, our challenges are the same in this matter. Jeremiah, it says, But ah, Lord Yahweh, I said, behold, the prophets are saying to them, You will not see the sword, you will not have famine, but I will give you peace in this place. But then Yahweh said to me, The prophets are, not, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a vision of lies, divination, futility, and the deception of their own hearts. And skipping down, he says, there will be, they keep saying there will be no sword or famine in this land. But by that sword and famine, these prophets will meet their own end. And you can go on and on, Revelation, the judgment which we went through when we went through the seven churches of Revelation on Thyatira for the one who is leading God's people astray. And so, so don't for a moment think when God says, hey, you don't know who this person is. Well, you're not supposed to stand in judgment over your brother that you don't know. In terms of he can't judge his motivation. You can only judge what he was doing. So he's not with us, so do we have to reel him in? He's like, well, you should, you should test what he's saying. You should listen to what he's saying. You don't just believe it. He said, but, but also keep in mind that God, God knows and there is an eternal consequence for actions. You can hear a twofold emphasis if you take this in the context of the larger passage. This isn't a huge exposition on false teaching. You can almost hear Jesus saying, You guys are worried about this guy who is doing works in my name. Well, that is not for you to worry about. Make no mistake, I am taking false teachers very seriously. But number two... Those of you who want to be my disciples, you guys were just arguing over who wanted to be the greatest. You need to make sure that you're in this for the right reasons as well. Not to build up your reputation, but to serve God, to turn people's eyes to him. Because we all know cases, even when people have right theology, that it seems they're more concerned with the fact that you know that they're serving God than the fact that they're actually trying to lead people to God. And that's a problem, too. You need more than just good theology, right? A person who is entrusted with teaching or leadership should actually care not just about how good the presentation was, how articulate the sermon was. Like, do I get style points for that? It's kind of like the Olympics is coming up. Some of them you get, like, technical merit, and then you get style points, like, you know, on, on gymnastics or, or something like that. But rather, whether we accurately convey the Word of God and do they actually care about the people that they're ministering to. Because leading a people astray is a big deal. Now, I do, I do want to give you a little bit. I'm not letting anyone off the hook because we want to take this seriously. But if you're ever a Sunday school teacher and said, oh, no, 
I just realized that I taught a story wrong about, about the fish and the loaves, or I taught a story wrong. Um, the word here, causing these little ones to stumble, this is not like somebody who accidentally messed up a Bible story or a reference. The word there is used of the baited triggering mechanism of an animal trap. So this is like baiting an animal trap, putting, putting the worm on a hook, so to speak. These are people who either deliberately or through gross negligence to feed their own ego are leading others off course. So on the one hand, we have to be very serious when we're dealing with holy things. I don't want you to think like, oh no, I, I misquoted a verse. I mean, God's, God's looking over my shoulder. God, there is grace, there is grace, and yet we have to take it seriously. But look at the punishment. Um, it says a heavy millstone. Uh, we don't use millstones very much anymore. There's lots of different sizes of millstones. You can get one that's like, I don't know, about yay big, size of a basketball. Even some that are smaller, those little, little millstones. And then you got the really big ones. And he says a heavy millstone. So we're talking hundreds or thousands of pounds. These are the ones that would be pulled by the animals as they ground the grain. So in other words, when this is tied around your neck and you were thrown into the sea, you were going all the way down, and you are not coming back up. Um, it, was a, it was a powerful metaphor um, of judgment. And typically speaking, because the Jewish people were largely desert people and didn't have a huge maritime uh, tradition, they didn't like the water. So to be thrown into the sea was to be thrown into judgment um, in, in their understanding. And so we, we understand that while it will be horrible for many on the day of judgment, it will be especially bad for those who cause the little ones to stumble. Um, Garland says, Jesus makes the point, it is better to drown in the sea with no chance of escape than to face the judgment that God will dish out to those who lead others to sin. So even, even for believers, our mind often goes to the false teachers right away, we need, to, we need to take this very seriously. We know in the book of James, it says, Let not many presume to be teachers, for we shall face a stricter judgment. As you can imagine, that's not my favorite verse in the Bible. And so I'm the reason I'm like, I, I, think, I think I should uh, get a different job sometimes. That doesn't mean that I, because, because you take it seriously. I mean, any, any pastor or teacher that you sit under should take it seriously. Um, and while, while our judgment may, may not be about eternal destination, we understand this is a serious matter before God. Again, Garland says, in speaking to the disciples, Jesus shows more concern over the fragile faith of the little ones than he is showing to the fragile egos to those who would, who would be in positions and might lord it over them or ignore others. So he is saying, look, you guys are all concerned about who's on my team. You're all concerned about your position. You need to be concerned about the people. You need to be concerned about the truth. Eyes off yourself, eyes on the mission, eyes on your Savior. Firmly on your Savior, firmly on the truth. But, but don't, don't make it about yourselves. Now, in the middle of this, while Jesus is giving the warning against ego, he, uh, against leading others astray, either intentionally or accidentally, to feed um, someone's selfish desires, he continues to warn against sins beyond those of pride and idolatry. Uh, reading forward, it says, verse 43, And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands and to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if having two feet cause, if having your two feet to be cast, oh, excuse me, and if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having two feet to be cast into hell. And where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye ca causes you to stumble, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus is now talking about 
continuing in sin. Um, Utley says, and er almost every reference would say, this is obviously hyperbole given for emotional impact. And this is a way that is very common in the Near East and those cultures to give a purposeful exaggeration to make a very serious point. But the, the meaning should be obvious. Sin is dangerous and the consequences are eternal. Garland clarifies this. Jesus is not incurring self-mutilation. But some Christians have taken Jesus' words literally and have mutilated themselves in obedience, such as Origen, who castrated himself. True story. Church father. Struggling with lust and thought, well, apparently I'm supposed to take care of this. Now, most modern readers aren't going to fall into that error, that we recognize a hyperbole. But that doesn't mean we should go to the other extreme and then treat it dismissively. The point is that sin, sin is serious, and Jesus is using violent graphic language to make a very serious point that sin is violence against our souls. If we understood that he's saying it's better to lose your hand than to live in a way of sin that sends you to hell. Because, because sin is violence. It brings death. It brings spiritual separation, eternal separation, and it brings condemnation. And even for the believer who is saved by grace, it brings pain and devastation both upon ourselves and on others. And it's offensive to our, the holy God who saved us, the Savior who loves us, who died for those very same sins. And so we need to take it seriously. When he's talking about this, this imagery, it, sin is bad enough that we need to do whatever we can to distance from it. Yeah, you're not supposed to actually cut off your hand or gouge out your eyes. But if the choice was really between your hand or your soul, that should be an easy choice. Now, in the middle of this, I just want to say as a quick parenthesis, these verses aren't designed to give us a specific teaching on hell. It's a very quick hyperbole and, and commenting on it. But they are very, but they do talk. This is a very real place, and eternity is real. And it describes it as a fire, unquenched, unending, separate from God. A place to be avoided. The word here used here is Gehenna. Gehenna, um, in the Old Testament, this was a valley. It's just outside of Jerusalem. It's where, at the very worst of the nation of Israel, where they would go and they had offerings of child sacrifice. And in one sense, because oftentimes they would say they'd offer them in the flames, those flames were associated with hell. I mean, what could be worse than offering your babies to the flames? Well, later on when the Jewish people came back, they were so ashamed of this that they turned that valley there into a garbage dump outside of the city. And so they would take their, their garbage from the city into the valley and they would burn it in the valley. They would burn their garbage. And so the, the fires were always going on in the valley and it was you know, just to burn the refuse. And so when Jesus says, and the word which became synonymous with hell and is in Gehenna, it, it is that word picture of that where the garbage is being burned outside the city forever. And then we see that hell is the appropriate judgment for sin because sin is the trash. And very much like the people would take their garbage to be burned we, we, we need to give our sins back to Jesus and say, take them from me. We know you paid for them, but take them from me. It's the garbage in my life, and I don't, I don't want it anymore. It's appropriate that it will be burned up and taken away. I mean, think of how horrible it would be if the, if the garbage man stopped coming. Some of you, when you forget to take your trash can out for a week, and you're just like, oh, no. It's always on the worst possible week. But let Jesus throw your sins away. Don't cling to them while they're being flung into the garbage furnace. But some people do that, don't they? They hear about the free gift of salvation in Jesus, but, but they love their sin too much to let it go. And so instead of giving their sins to Jesus at the cross and in return receiving his forgiveness and salvation and righteousness, they refuse to receive his grace. And like those people who don't realize you shouldn't iron a shirt while wearing it, their sin is a, is a great folly. Because in that case, it's not a temporary burn, but it leads to eternal destruction. 
And I know most people aren't quite so clear about the rejection of God. It's um, those who are choosing sin. Because most, of, most people I've learned use the gray matter up here just to justify what you already want in your heart. What we think is thinking is just giving cover for the decisions that we want to make. People are really good at rationalization. Not actually at uh, uh, pursuing the truth, but just giving reasons for justifying what we've already determined to do. And so a lot of people will say, well, I, I'm not just choosing my sin. I don't believe in, in a God. That just, is, that just seems too far-fetched. And a lot of times that's cover because it's easier to go there in your brain than it is to actually own the fact that, no, you just like living in rebellion. And, and there's plenty of cases where you really break a person down and have an honest conversation. They could say, well, I just don't really like what God teaches, so I don't believe in him. Uh, most, most people aren't that clear in their thinking. But I, but I remember when I was in youth ministry years and years ago, actually I was still an intern for youth ministry going to college and helping out with the youth group. And we gave a gospel presentation on a certain night after a certain event. And one of the young high school girls coming out uh, was overheard and, and it was very sad. But her response to the gospel was, I don't care if Jesus comes into my heart as long as he doesn't tell me what to do. And you see, that's really sometimes what it's about. When Jesus says, if your sin will lead you into hell, cut it off. Don't cling so tightly to it that you refuse the grace of Jesus Christ. And I, and I hope, I've thought of that often. I hope that time has shown her the emptiness and the destruction of sin. Not because I hope she personally suffered. I don't wish that on anybody. But even if she did, how much better to suffer in this life for a moment than to suffer apart from God forever? Because if you just cling to your sins like a millstone to be dragged down forever into the fires which are never quenched. Jesus says people need, people need to take sin seriously. There's one more verse here. Um, it's kind of a curious verse, so I want to make sure I address this before we move on. Verse four, actually, verses 49 and 50, it says, For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, what, what, will you make, what will you have to make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. You know, I almost skipped over that because I, I figured all of you knew, like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense, right? Everyone's going to be salted with fire. Um, the clearest, quickest... Um, Explanations were in a couple of commentaries. Got questions said, um, this alludes to the Old Testament practice of sacrifices being seasoned with salt. The point is that the followers are sacrifices to God, and the idea of being seasoned with salt means two things. It means that believers will be purified and believers will be preserved. This is kind of, on talking about sin and talking about judgment, what a, what a, what a great thought. You can imagine them hearing this, maybe not understanding the full nature of grace. Obviously, the cross has not happened yet, and the disciples are trying to be a little bit afraid, and he's saying, no, but believers will be purified, and believers will be preserved. Additional commentaries also say salt and fire both convey thoughts of purification. It was a means of healing, purification, and preservation. It was used to seal covenants, like in, in Numbers chapter 18, 19. You can see that salt was a way of sealing a covenant. And fire was often used to refer to purification. So in this context, um, combining this sermon with last week as well, the believers, the disciples, they're called to be different. We're not called to live for our glory, but we're called to live for God's glory. We're not to be living to be esteemed, but rather to be living sacrifices. And many people would serve God to gain personal honor. But Jesus is calling his disciples to set aside dreams of present glory and instead view themselves as sacrifices. And also in view of today's sermon, we're, we're called to, to pursue purity. Even as we thank God for his preservation of us. Now, when we talk about um, false teachers... Um, They've been around since the beginning. The Apostle John says, you know that many Antichrists have already come, talking of those who are against Christ. And we know, as we already read in, in 2 Peter, 
and you could go to all the books of the new, almost all the books of the New Testament, to the letters of John, the letters of Peter, the letters of Paul, the letters of Jude, that there are those who peddle error, who are not, who are not worth listening to, who lead others astray. And the spirit of error is still at work. And people who call people to different paths, to different gospels. Um, a lot of you know I spent 12 years as a senior pastor in Utah, and that, that was hard. That was at times heartbreaking. Really, really great people following a, another gospel. And whether, whether the people who are still continuing in this deception or the people who had left the predominant church there who then became hardened to things of faith. It was kind of that like, fool me once, shame on you. I'm never going to be fooled again. And it was, it was really hard. It's a very hard mission field. Uh, if you know any missionaries or pastors in Utah, pray for them. It, it, it is it's difficult. But we, we need to know the truth. We need to know the truth. We need to protect ourselves. We need to protect others and make sure we are leading people into the truth and not to error. We're leading people to the truth and not in uh, promotion of our own egos. And looking ahead, I hope you don't lose a hand or your eyes. I, I hope so. I hope that's obvious. Uh, but even if you do, um, if you hear what Jesus is saying, even if you had to, rather, it's still better. And I shared this uh, late, earlier this year when my uncle had passed away, um, that how, how he, he lost his leg as a high school senior in, in a car wreck. And it was, it was pretty traumatic. But the, the truth of that, and for those of you who remember the story, was it was that event that caused him to come to Jesus Christ. Because before that, he'd grown up around the gospel. But he's like, I want to live my own way. Maybe I'll consider this when I'm older. When he almost died after that car wreck, he gave his life to Christ, and he never turned back. And he would say things which very much echoed this passage. He said, it's a lot better for my leg to be in hell than my soul. And that's what Jesus is saying here, that we need to be willing to realize Sin leads to destruction. Sin is the garbage. Don't cling to the garbage and remain separated from God forever. Well, um, even beyond the context of this verse, just to wrap it up a little bit here, I was thinking of this passage that I was talking to my wife this week because she's out there in Thailand, and uh, you know, she was saying some of this is really, really hard because some of these people just have nothing. And uh, there's people who've been in generational cycles of poverty. They've grown up in basically this dump city that's on the outskirts, right on the border. Basically, they, they don't have any place. They, they don't assimilate well into Thai culture. My impression is, I could be wrong, that the Thai culture doesn't really want them to assimilate. So they're people without a country at this point. They can't go back, but they don't have a place to go forward. But some of the newer um, refugees who've come over in, in cycles of violence were actually not just... Um, poor farmers or uneducated people fleeing, but some of them were really, really well-to-do. She says it was really humbling to see they're working at this boarding school and some of the pastors who are ministering to their own people, um, people who now live in, like, single-bedroom or two-bedroom concrete homes without, without plumbing, without lighting, that used to be doctors and lawyers in Myanmar and had their own house servants. I mean, could you, could you imagine the whiplash of that for their high school kids? Is there some of them working? Like, we had a servant in an upscale neighborhood, and now we're on the very bottom rung. And so you can, you can think about that, about how, how they're now living in poverty. And in one sense, it's a word picture of running for your life instead of enjoying the pleasures of this world, because they ran to live, or they ran to flee something which was a greater danger to them, and their houses and their servants and the electricity and the plumbing was not worth hanging on to. And I hope in a, in a picture we can see um, our life is more important than the passing pleasures of sin. But what else really stood out to our team is some of these people, the joy with which they can still praise Jesus. Because they know it's better. This world is passing. It's not forever. And they still gather for church and fill it up, and they're doing their best. But because what they have lost does not compare for what God has in store for those who love him. 
So when Jesus says, let go of sins, it's not because God is a killjoy. It's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. It does, it's not because he doesn't want you to have the abundant life. It's because he is life. And sin is destruction. And he is preparing life forever with him in all of the glories and rewards and honor for his people who have followed him, who can walk with him in his never-ending love. So I, I, ho- I hope we... Uh, we have to learn. We have to, like I said at the very beginning, and it wasn't intended. It was just what happened yesterday. While we live in this world and we walk in this world, we also have to learn that, to step out of it and say what we leave behind here is okay because we have a permanent home and a better future. But because we are citizens of that home, we need to live differently. We need to live differently. We need to live godly lives. We need to cut the sin out of our life and live pure pure lives. And as we live here, we need to live not for our own glory, but for the, one, for the one who saved us, that others too might know the hope and the life that's in